news had reached the church in Rome. Cristóvão Ferreira, sent to Japan by the Society of Jesus in Portugal, after undergoing the torture of the pit at Nagasaki, had apostatized. An experienced missionary held in the highest respect, he had spent 33 years in Japan, had occupied the high position of provincial, and had been a source of inspiration to priests and faithful alike. The church in Rome could not believe that this man, however terrible the torture, could be induced to renounce his faith and grovel before the infidel. These are some of the opening words within the initial pages of Shusako Endo's classic novel, Silence. Since the book's release in 1966, it has continued to garner an immense legacy, not only for the unique lens through which the story is depicted, but also as a source of continued analysis, diving deeper into the religious and moral complexities woven within. It is a story that both Christians and non-Christians alike can find fascinating. Over the years, there have been several film adaptions of it, with the most recent and perhaps the most famous being the 2016 adaption of the same name, a film directed by the acclaimed Martin Scorsese and starring actors Andrew Garfield, Adam Driver, and Liam Neeson. It is this version of the film which we will be reviewing here today, along with an examination of the novel itself, as we look to not only compare the two, but most prominently try to understand their deeper meanings. Silence is not a story that I'd typically be covering on this channel. Although it takes place in pre-modern Japan and does involve samurai, it is by no means a samurai film. Instead, it is the agonizing journey of a foreigner who arrives in Japan only to have his very core identity and beliefs challenged in some of the most difficult ways imaginable. And because of this, this video will not really take the form of my typical reviews, but will rather be an examination of the overall story and specifically how it deals with the concept of faith, as well as how it also does shed some interesting light on the Japan of this time. Yet in order to do this properly, I need to give a spoiler warning. This video will be full spoilers for both the book and the film, as it would be nearly impossible to dissect the subject matter without revealing key details. Additionally, this video is, of course, going to be getting pretty heavily into the topic of religion, something which can obviously be a pretty delicate subject. With that said, let's dive in and begin to examine the story of Silence. Silence was written by the Japanese author Shusako Endo, a man who suffered from his own form of identity struggle as a Christian himself, as he found difficulty treading the line between his own Catholic faith and his Japanese culture. It was this conflict that must have drawn him to the idea of a story that is initially set up through real historical details, regarding several missionaries who had come to Japan in the early years of the Edo period, a time when Christianity had recently been outlawed and was under intense persecution. It was here where these missionaries would have their faiths brutally put to the test. Father Cristóbal Ferreira was indeed a real historical figure, a real Jesuit missionary who traveled to Japan during a time of increasing Christian persecution, and who after capture and torture, eventually renounced his faith. This would prompt another Italian Jesuit by the name of Giuseppe Chiara to head to Japan in search of Ferreira. All of this is true, however the story of silence branches off from this, crafting a tale of historical fiction as Chiara is replaced by several of Ferreira's old students, now priests themselves, who journey to Japan, not only in search of Ferreira himself, but also to continue spreading the faith and helping Japanese Christians in hiding. On this expedition there is Sebastian Rodriguez, played by Andrew Garfield, and is most closely meant to resemble the real figure of Chiara. He is accompanied by Francisco Gerpe, called Garupe in the film, and played by Adam Driver. After traveling across the seas from Europe to Asia, they arrive in Macau, a Chinese port city under the rule of the Portuguese. While here, they meet with the prominent and real historical figure of Alessandro Vellignano, a high-ranking Jesuit and one of the foremost leading Christian figures in Asia after the time of Francis Xavier. It is in Macau that they not only hear more of what became of Father Ferreira, but also where Vellignano tries desperately to persuade them to not continue their journey to Japan for the fear of the danger that awaits them there now. 
In particular, in the book, the Shimabara Rebellion of 1637 is repeatedly brought up as a horrifying recent incident that occurred, which served to firmly stamp out the Christian fervor in Kyushu. But also in Macau, it is where Valignano informs them of the new inquisitor leading the efforts against the Christians, a cruel magistrate by the name of Inoue. He is described as a ruthless and cunning individual who has devised new ways of torturing Christians and breaking the will of missionaries like Ferreira. And most shocking of all, it is revealed to them that this Inoue figure actually happened to previously have been a Japanese Christian himself. Regardless of the threat they faced, Rodriguez and Gerpe both confirm their resolve to go anyway, and with this, they are given the blessing to do so. And it is here we get introduced to perhaps one of the most fascinating figures of the entire story, a Japanese man by the name of Kichichiro. Kichichiro is a drunkard and a castaway, stranded in China. Yet with the help of Rodriguez and Gerpe, he is recruited as their guide back to Japan. Initially, they can't quite tell if Kichichiro was a Christian or not, as he swore he wasn't, yet his understanding of the Portuguese language rose their suspicion. Eventually, the three of them arrive in Japan, on the island of Kyushu, and it is here the story fully begins. Immediately, they come to be united with various other Japanese Christians, those from the village of Tomogi and others from Goto. And for a while, they almost seem to forget about their mission of finding Father Ferreira, as instead, they take to the role of priests for the small communities of Christians they come to serve, giving mass, baptizing infants, hearing confessions, and much more. They see it as their duty to continue the work started by past missionaries by helping lead these Japanese Christians in the faith. And there is some suspicion that begins to emerge regarding how much the Japanese actually understand Christianity itself, or if their understanding of it is somewhat flawed. Yet Rodriguez and Gerpe can't really tell. But it is also through them that they begin to understand more about Japan. Not only the culture itself, but also more of the persecution that the Christians have had to endure. And eventually, they come to witness it firsthand, as the local samurai authority begin to suspect Christian worship within the village of Tomogi, and brutally execute those who refuse to tarnish Christian symbols. It is here we get introduced to a form of test devised by Japanese officials, as a way that people can prove they are either not Christians, or as a way that other real Christians can apostatize, renouncing their faith. This is the ritual of the fumie, where a small metal slab bearing a religious symbol of Christ, called a fumie, is placed on the ground and individuals are forced to step on it, or bear the consequences. Those who trample upon it are immediately freed, while those who refuse or show any difficulty in stepping are either continually tested or brutally and publicly executed. Eventually, Rodriguez and Gerpe decide to split up, and head deeper into the country after the Christians of Tomogi are repeatedly repressed by the local samurai, as even prominent members of the village end up being killed. And this is where Rodriguez winds up once again in the company of Kichichiro, who promises to lead him to another community of Christians elsewhere. Yet sadly, it is here where Kichichiro betrays Rodriguez, turning him over to the government. So begins the most difficult leg of Rodriguez's journey, as now imprisoned, his faith is continually tested. Surprisingly though, he is not physically tortured but rather treated quite well, all while witnessing the continued suffering of other Japanese Christians who are imprisoned alongside him, with the only way for him to stop the torment of all being to simply apostatize, either vocally or through stepping on the fumie. Throughout the film, and more prominent in the book, is Rodriguez's obsession with Jesus. Not something that is hard to believe given his status as a Jesuit and nearly uncheckable faith, but there is something about the way he lays awake at night dreaming of Jesus, in particular, his face, something which Rodriguez perhaps comes to resemble through no coincidence within both the writing and the film. He keeps trying to picture what the face of Christ would be, something which we know that nobody living at that time would have any ideas of, yet he references artwork that he has seen depicting Christ, and the common bearded image we have come to know. This later in the book comes to contrast with how the Japanese envision him, not only physically but also spiritually. Yet, as I mentioned, Rodriguez also comes to ponder upon the actions of Christ, comparing his selfless nature and the suffering he would endure to that of his own, with perhaps one of the most crucial elements being Christ's relationship to Judas, who Rodriguez continually sees Kichichiro as akin to. 
Throughout the story, Rodriguez's views on Kichichiro are continually shifting. A figure he at first completely despises for almost everything he is, continually asking himself how even Christ could love a figure as wretched as he. Yet after learning the sad fate Kichichiro has had to endure as a hidden Christian himself, his despise turns into pity, even after Kichichiro betrays him. Still, Kichichiro continues to seek forgiveness, even while Rodriguez is imprisoned. It seems Rodriguez's continued thoughts on Jesus start to take over his mind, comparing himself to Jesus in many ways, and trying hardest to make the same choices as Jesus would, all except for one, which we will get into. Opposed to him, the Japanese, under the cruel leadership of the Inquisitor Inoue, take an approach to the torture of Rodriguez that he was not expecting. His suffering is not physical, but mental and spiritual. They seek to relentlessly break his will until finally renouncing his own god, everything Rodriguez has ever stood for. His pain is brilliantly portrayed by Andrew Garfield, who really showcases his acting skill. It's crazy the range he has as an actor, and I have really come to love him in his more serious roles like this. You really get the feeling that he has been through the absolute worst torment possible, as he is shaken to the core and his entire faith and sense of being is completely questioned. What is really interesting though is that quickly we come to learn that the Inquisitor and the government don't even care if Rodriguez is a Christian or not. Rather, they just want him to publicly apostatize, as to stop other Japanese from continuing to believe. As in their eyes, it is not really God that the Japanese Christians have come to truly serve, but rather the influential missionaries that have come to arrive on their shores. Again and again, at least in the book, it is mentioned that this is just a formality, and that no one cares what he really believes so long as he just publicly renounces Christianity. But even with this act being described as meaningless, Rodriguez still cannot bring himself to renounce his faith, perpetuating the suffering of others. This also brings up an interesting moment which is actually different in both the book and the film. It happens in Tomogi, before several Japanese Christians are forced to turn themselves over to the government. They ask Rodriguez and Gerpe what they should do if they are forced to step upon the Fumie, to which Rodriguez tells them to trample, trample, knowing that doing so will save their lives and is no real indication of themselves forsaking Christ. Yet what is interesting is that in the film, although Rodriguez says this, Gerpe then speaks up telling them to not do such a thing, and questions why Rodriguez would ever say to do something so blasphemous. And on one hand, this is fascinating because while Rodriguez is telling others to do this, it is not something he can easily bring himself to do, even to save others. But on the other hand, it also separates him quite a bit from Gerpe. Both in the book and film, Gerpe is seen as more of a rough and strict figure, often himself coming to have many more issues with the Japanese than Rodriguez. Yet, like Rodriguez, he is still firm in his conviction and commitment to the Japanese Christians, even going so far as to sacrifice his own life later while trying to save some from drowning. But it's this detail of Gerpe questioning Rodriguez when he tells the Christians to trample on the Fumie that I think is a great moment in the film, one which also foreshadows his later resolve to give his own life and become a martyr himself, something which Rodriguez would ultimately be unable to do. Also, I need to highlight Adam Driver as well. I've become a massive Adam Driver fan over the years, and I feel like this film is really a hidden gem. Not just for him, but also a lot of the other actors in it who all shine. Both Adam Driver and Andrew Garfield were told to lose a ton of weight for the role, and it really shows, as both of them come to look nearly starved in some moments of the film. Both actors really just come to embody the characters of Rodriguez and Gerpe in the most believable way possible, and were who I was envisioning in my head for the characters as I read the book, being that I had originally seen the movie first. But getting back to Rodriguez, it is through all of these unfortunate challenges he faces that, slowly and steadily, his faith does begin to get shaken, most prominently seen through his anger and despair at God's absence during such suffering of Christians. He does not hear God, nor does God intervene no matter how much he prays. Eventually, he begins to question if God even exists. This is the silence that both the title of the book and the film speak of. The silence of God. And this is once again something I feel that the book approaches far better, as through being more inside Rodriguez's head we start to see this notion grow more naturally as it gnaws at him and he continually tries to suppress it, only for the idea that there is no God to return again later with a vengeance. 
But you have to understand, it was never the goal of the Japanese to make Rodriguez stop believing in God. In fact, there is even a moment where the interpreter figure discusses how much commonality there is, and how much they could share in terms of faith. Rather, the Japanese simply want to stifle the spread of the faith in an organized manner. As like I mentioned before, they seem to care little for what individuals themselves believe so long as it poses no overall threat. And I think there is a lack of context here in both the book and film, as we are never really fully told why the Japanese have worked so tirelessly to stop the spread of Christianity. There is at least one page in the book that briefly dives into this, but overall, it's not really brought up in detail, which might make it hard for some to really understand why the Japanese would be trying so hard to rid any organized Christian efforts from their shores. To describe it in a simple way, the spread of Christianity in Japan had become increasingly problematic and threatening over the years. Not only due to the issues it caused with uprooting and damaging the established Buddhist institutions, but also because there was a real danger of how much influence Christian missionaries in foreign countries began to possess over the Christian daimyo. There were many in Japan who were cautious of this and were wary of its effects, lest Japan fall more under the influence of foreign powers as other countries in Asia had become in the worst cases through colonization. So the logic behind wanting to simply remove the threat entirely at the time was not an idea that was not somewhat unjustified. It was more an effort of caution than anything else, to protect Japan as it was at the time. Yet over time, despite the Japanese initially just expelling foreign Christians from the country, missionaries still kept trying to come in regardless. This had the unfortunate effect of the Japanese becoming more brutal in their repression, in an effort to not only stamp it firmly out, but to also dissuade more missionaries from coming. In the story, this concept is explained by the Japanese more plainly, as they simply want to keep the two religions separate. From the Japanese standpoint in the story, there is not a right or wrong answer to religion, and never do they try to force their faith upon Rodriguez in any way. Rather, what they seek to do instead is prove to Rodriguez why his goal is flawed and why he should simply give it up. And of course, the main way they go about doing this is by forcing Rodriguez to witness the suffering of the Japanese Christians, who because of influential figures like Rodriguez, continue to follow the Christian faith. Continue to follow Rodriguez. What is important to remember, of course, is that throughout history and across the world, Christians are also quite guilty of cruelty while trying to not only wash away other faiths, but also in their efforts to convert others as well. Whether it through inquisitions, crusades and war, native assimilation schools, and so much more. All the Japanese are trying to do is just keep the two religions separate. One is not better than the other, but that Christianity does not belong in Japan. And this is where all they want is essentially a political stunt where Rodriguez publicly apostatizes to not only dissuade others, but to also remove him as an influential symbol to the Japanese Christians. And this is where we need to get into the figure of Inoue. Inoue is described as many things. The Inquisitor, the Magistrate, the Daimyo, a cunning and ruthless tactician, but also someone who is kind, sensible, friendly looking, and himself even a former Japanese Christian. Although I love the portrayal of Inoue in the film, as I think the actor Issei Ogata gave an iconic performance as him, I think one of the film's only failures was that it failed to properly build up the figure of Inoue in the same way the book did. As I mentioned before, we hear about Inoue first from Valignano in Macau, and later from the villagers who fear him. And although we come to see plenty of intimidating samurai leaders who bark out angrily, we are never sure who Inoue is. But there is one individual who keeps appearing, an old and plump man who Rodriguez keeps describing as kind, someone who interacts with the villagers in a friendly and sensible manner, speaking to them nicely on their own level. We see this figure various times, and he even comes off as almost sympathetic to Rodriguez during an interrogation with several other officials. It is here that Rodriguez finally lashes out and demands to be taken before Inoue, instead of being continually questioned. And this is where we learn that this kind old man that he has been continually encountering is actually the cunning and ruthless Inoue. Rodriguez comes to have plenty of fascinating philosophical sparring matches with Inoue as the two continue to try to put each other in a metaphorical checkmate regarding their beliefs. And although in the film Inoue is portrayed a bit more as quick to anger, 
In the book, he is much more calm and calculating, truly proving himself to be an opponent the likes of which Rodriguez was never suspecting he would have to face in Japan. Where Rodriguez had readied himself for physical torture and execution as other missionaries had endured, instead, Inoue's methods are those which are made to torture his mental state and deeper faith. He seeks to break Rodriguez not in body, but in spirit. And finally, we are introduced to Inoue's greatest achievements thus far. One is the pit, a horrifying method of torture where individuals are hung upside down with incisions cut behind their ears so that the blood slowly drips from their body. The pit is where Inoue has tortured many Christians, getting them all to apostatize, and it is also the way he was able to make Father Ferreira renounce his own faith. And it is in the end that Rodriguez is finally brought before Ferreira. The man he initially came to Japan to find, but Ferreira is now unrecognizable. He has taken a Japanese name, Sawano Chuan, and has taken a Japanese wife and child. He now works for Inoue, helping the Japanese in many ways, not just in terms of his own knowledge and insight, but also as a continued source of tearing down Christianity, as living proof of its failure in Japan. The initial meeting between Ferreira and Rodriguez in both the book and film is perhaps the most fascinating moment in the entire story, as the two engage in a passionate exchange about faith and failure. And what of course helps once again is another stunning performance by Liam Neeson. Rodriguez argues in favor of Christianity and the Japanese Christians, specifically those who have given their lives, and Ferreira explains how Christianity just does not spread in Japan, how it does not take proper root, how Japan is a swamp where nothing new can grow. To this, Rodriguez yells that it is because the roots have been torn up, only then for Ferreira to respond by dropping perhaps the biggest bombshell of the entire story, that the Japanese version of Christianity is not Christianity at all. That the Japanese terms used to describe elements of Christianity are just masks which cover pre-existing Japanese beliefs. That the Japanese are widely misinterpreting every aspect of Christianity because it was never explained properly to them. And that every missionary who has come to Japan has failed to realize this error. And that in the end, they are not truly dying for Christ. Instead, they are dying for Rodriguez, dying for what he represents. And knowing this is what I feel ultimately breaks Rodriguez. Everything he has endured up until this point has continually worn him down. The suffering of the Japanese, the silence of God, and now the realization that they have misinterpreted Christianity itself. This all leads to Rodriguez seeing the pit for himself and more Christians being tortured. And once again, the only way for it to end is for Rodriguez to simply apostatize. This is the same fate that Ferreira had not only endured but also witnessed. As it was not the pit itself which broke him, but the usage of the pit on others. Ferreira asks Rodriguez, in this moment, what would Jesus do? Allow people to continue suffering or to step on the fumie, thereby saving them? And it's here, with the fumie in front of him, with the image of Jesus upon it, that Rodriguez finally hears the voice of Christ. And with this, Rodriguez finally steps. In the aftermath, we see that Rodriguez, like Ferreira, is given a new Japanese name and family. That he is to live out the remainder of his days in Japan, like Ferreira, as a constant reminder that Christianity does not work in Japan. He is told by Inoue that there remains other Christian villages within the country, but that without the guidance of priests like Rodriguez, they will all wither away thanks to their distortion of Christianity. He and Ferreira come to both internally despise one another for what they have become and what they were forced to do. And we are even told more about Ferreira's continued work to try to undermine Dutch trade. But in the end for Rodriguez, he forgives Kichichiro and comes to live out a quiet life, still a Christian at heart, but knowing that he would never again be accepted by other missionaries or members of the Catholic Church back in Europe. Rodriguez has come to realize that his own faith meant more than the doctrine of the Church, and that his own love of God was undefeated, despite his own external appearance as an apostate priest. Stepping on the fumie did not destroy his faith, and in doing so, he made the hardest sacrifice he would ever be forced to make. But he did it to save others, 
and had come to realize that by doing so, he had not truly broken off his own connection to God. This is a powerful story, and like I said much earlier, one which I think many people can find fascinating, whether or not they are Christians themselves. But obviously too for the film specifically, this is a very hard film to watch as well, not just for its contents, but also clocking in at around a lengthy 2 hours and 40 minutes, all with almost no music whatsoever. Instead, you are greeted with gorgeous cinematography and brilliant performances, and absolutely gut-wrenching depictions of suffering. Obviously, on the book side of things, what you get is an even more enriching journey through the depths of faith, through the mind of a man whose very identity and purpose is being challenged. Because of all this, I find it hard to flat out recommend both the book and the film to just anyone, but I will say, if you do choose to check them out, you are certainly in for an experience. But with that said, for those of you who have already seen Silence or read the book, what are your thoughts? What are some things you may have taken away from the story? I'd love to hear what you have to say in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most interesting.